Good morning. Happy Easter. We've still got folks uh, coming on in, so if you've got some seats next to you, maybe you can squeeze in toward the middle and maybe free up some seats on the outside. Uh, I know that some of these people that are still coming in would greatly appreciate that. It is great to see you this morning on this beautiful, hasn't the Lord given us a beautiful morning this morning? Uh, on this Easter Sunday morning as we celebrate his resurrection. Thank you. Yes, all those applause are for him. Uh, my name is Cliff. I'm the worship pastor here. It is great to have you visiting with us. If you are a guest or you are visiting with us for the first time or maybe it's just maybe your second or third time and uh, we don't know you yet, we'd love to get to know you. Inside the Proclaimer, which is the program you received as you came in, there's a QR code. If you would scan that QR code and just answer those questions, let us know of your visit. You might have questions about what we believe as a church. You might want to know more about what it means to become a member. Anyway, we can answer all those questions, and we would love to know of your visit with us this morning. Before we get started, I just have a couple of quick announcements that we want to talk about, some exciting things that God is doing here at Liberty Baptist Church. First of all, coming up the second weekend in April, April 12th and 13th, we have a wonderful women's conference coming up. So if you are a lady, we would encourage you to get registered for this. We have Dr. Monica Brendan, Brennan, who is a professor at LU, coming to speak, um, and the cost is $10. You can contact Melissa Small. Uh, her phone number is in the Proclaimer. You can call her to get registered, um, and there's lunch provided for, for all of it, and uh, we would encourage you to get registered for that women's conference. It's going to be a wonderful time of discipleship and worship together. Uh, we also have coming up uh, in, in April is our men's night out. Our men's ministry of, uh, of Liberty Baptist is going to be um, gathering together at the Charlie's Waterfront Cafe in Farmville at 6 o'clock on the 25th. It is $22 a person, and we would encourage you to get registered by the 15th. You can contact John Caldwell, and his phone number is also in the Proclaimer. You can call him to get registered for that. Also, the middle of April, on April 13th, which is Saturday night, we have Charles Billingsley in concert. Charles is a local artist here in the Lynchburg area, and if you've heard his music, you will know that Charles not only has an incredible voice, but he is an incredible man of God and loves Jesus, and we are going to be blessed by his presence and his singing uh, and encouraged in our faith with a concert on Saturday night, April 13th. It is, it is completely free. There are no tickets. There's no charge, so we would encourage you to come and bring friends and family members. Our Good Years, which is our 55 and plus group, is getting together on April 17th at noon in the Fellowship Hall for a time of uh, fellowship together. It's going to be a uh, covered dish, and we would ask that you get registered by the 15th. Um, you can contact the church and make sure that they know you're coming. I know that they would love to have you be part of that. And as a final announcement, one of the things that we love to do is pour into the lives of young people here at Liberty Baptist. We have a ministry called Trail Life that we partner with. And right now, that Trail Life ministry is looking for a couple of men who have a desire to make a difference in the lives of young boys. If you have a, a desire to do that and you want to mentor some young boys, we would encourage you to contact John Stratton. His phone number is also in the Proclaimer. This is a wonderful opportunity for you to invest in the younger generation and uh, these young men that are coming up, and I know that they would greatly appreciate that. He is risen. Ah, y'all are good Baptists. That's great. Let's stand together this morning and let's join our hearts in raising our voices and our praise to our risen King this morning. Jesus, we lift our praise to you. Low in the grave he lay, Jesus my Savior, waiting the coming day, Jesus my Lord. Up from the grave he arose, with a mighty triumph for his foes. He arose the victim from the dark domain, and he lives forever with his saints to reign. He arose, he arose, hallelujah, Christ arose. Hallelujah. Vainly they watched him. 
his pen, Jesus my Savior, plainly they sealed the dead, Jesus my Lord. Up from the grave he arose, with a mighty triumph for his foes, he arose the victim from the dark domain, and he lives forever with his saints to Oh, this is our testimony. Let's sing it out. Death cannot keep his prey. Jesus, my Savior, he tore the bars away. Jesus, my Lord, up from the grave he arose with a mighty triumph for his foes. He arose the victor from the dark domain, and he lives forever with his saints to reign. He arose, he arose, hallelujah, Christ arose. All right, ladies, we're going to sing that last line together, hallelujah, Christ arose, sing it out. Now the men, here we go. Hallelujah, Christ arose. Ladies. Men, sing that out. Hallelujah, Christ arose. Up from the grave he arose. With a mighty triumph for his foes. He arose the victor from the dark domain. He lives forever with his saints to reign. He arose, he arose, hallelujah, Christ arose. Hallelujah, Christ arose. Give him praise this morning.
you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this Resurrection Sunday. God, we thank you that in a world of darkness and death, you have brought light and resurrection. God, we thank you for the hope that you have given to our hearts and the hope that you have communicated to the world. God, we thank you that you love the world and have given your very Son to die on a cross and rise again so that we can have life. To the one today who is struggling, to the one today who feels hopeless, to the one today who is in despair, God, may you point them to an empty tomb to say that you have done something new, that you have brought life where there is death, that you have brought exhilaration where there was disappointment. And God, today I pray that as we look into your word, Holy Spirit of God, would you give us insight into what the resurrection means for us, not just for today, but for every day. God, we are here today on a Sunday, remembering that you rose from the dead on a Sunday, on the first day of the week. And God, we're thankful that this event has changed everything. God, we pray today for the person who does not know you. God, we pray today through the hearing of your word that they would believe in their heart and confess with their mouth, Jesus is Lord, and they would be saved. And so, God, today we ask you to convict hearts, to enlighten minds, to motivate wills so that we can be in conformity, not with our own will, but with your will. We pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated.
Sunday morning, that first Easter, when Mary and Mary Magdalene and Salome went to the grave expecting to anoint a dead body, they saw the angel sitting there, and they said, where is Jesus? The angel said, he is not here, he is risen. I submit to you tonight that that's the greatest news the world has ever heard. He is not here. He has conquered the grave. He's alive. Ladies and gentlemen, I believe that there's more proof that Jesus Christ rose from the dead than almost any other fact in Roman history. I don't believe there's a fact in ancient history today so well proven as the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But even if there was no proof, no historical proof, no scientific proof, and there is, I would still believe it because I believe this book is God's inspired word and the whole early church went up and down the country preaching the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That was the thing that shook the Roman Empire, that a man had risen from the dead, that he was alive, that death could not hold him. Christ is alive. He's a living Savior. picked the Billy Graham before I got up here, so I'm thinking. He just thought, well, if the preaching is thin, at least you heard Billy Graham give a good uh, Easter commission. Well, what a joy it is to be here on this Easter Sunday morning to declare that Jesus is alive. It's been a joy over these last several weeks that we have walked through the Gospel of John, and today we come to John 20 the resurrection passage where John in some ways gives us the final part of this gospel that closes out this gospel but really in many ways opens up a whole new chapter, a whole new story. I think it would be the gospel of John that would call us to ponder some of these questions. Do you long for the world to be a better place? Do you want the pain, the strife, the brokenness, the rage, the sickness, the death to cease? You know, we as humans live in such a confounding setting. At one moment, like this moment, we can hear music like this, or we can step right outside of these doors on this beautiful Easter Sunday morning and experience the beauty and glory of creation. And then we can, in other moments, see the goodness of humanity as one person ministers and gives so selflessly to another person. And we live in that moment. And yet in the next moment, we can get a phone call we can experience a situation that the ugliness and pain of the world hits us right in the face. You know, there are joys and there are burdens of being a pastor. I'll tell you, Liberty Baptists, for the last 10 months, a lot of the phone calls I have gotten start like this. Well, have you heard? And it's not good news. It's usually, did you hear someone is sick? Did you hear this relationship has broken down? Did you hear this struggle that has emerged? And, and we live in both of these at the same time. You know, the world can be so bright and so dark all in the same moment. The world can be both beautiful and ugly. It can be a place of wonder and at the same time be a place of discouragement. You know, it is as if we live in, because we do live in, God's good creation that has been profoundly marred by human sinfulness. It's as if we can see the glimmers of divine glory shrouded under a veil of tears. 
And if you've lived life at any moment, you realize this paradox runs at you day and night. Well, you may think as a 21st century American, that's a unique insight to you. But John saw this in a crystal clear fashion. And if I don't, maybe I'll show you something new today in the Bible. Not because it's new to the Bible, but because it's new to you. John in the Gospel of John realizes the paradox of this moment. The very first book of the Bible, the book of Genesis, begins with God thundering three words in the beginning. The Bible begins by revealing God as creator before the world was, God was. And you would think that which is done in Genesis 1 would remain in Genesis 1. But when John opens his gospel, he begins with the same three words that we find in Genesis 1. Because in John 1, 1, John says, in the beginning. But John is not just going to give us a retake of Genesis 1. John is giving us a fresh assessment of creation after sin has entered into it. John says this. It says, uh, he says in John 1, 3, that all things were created through him, and apart from him not one thing was created that has been created. Life was in him, and that life was the light of man. And then listen to John 1, 5. It says, the light shines in the darkness, God's light, that he spoke in Genesis 1, 3. And God said, let there be light. And yet John says in John 1, 5, that light shines in the darkness, and the darkness doesn't overcome it. John is making a reassessment here. He's saying, look at what has happened to God's good creation. The very God shines light into a world that he has already shed light into, but humans have made it so dark that there's a question that when God reshines his light, that the darkness might actually overcome the light. What a tough assessment of creation. But then John says, what is God going to do now that the world that he has created has become so fundamentally messed up? And John says in John chapter 1, he says, the word became flesh. The creator God took on flesh and dwelt among us. The great radical move of God described to us in the Gospels, the birth of Jesus. And then Jesus lives among us, and as we watch his life, we see that it is in Jesus that he has the power to overcome the very things that we messed up, because sickness and, and sorrow is because of death and sin. And so guess what? Jesus comes on the scene, and if you have a physical malady, he heals you. If you, have, uh, if you are under spiritual oppression, he liberates you. Even if the natural world gets out of order, Jesus sets it back in order. And the disciples think, in Jesus, he looks like he's going to set everything back into order. And then Jesus starts saying to his disciples, I'm going to die. They think that's a crazy, that's what you came to get rid of. Why would you die? And three times in the Gospel of Mark, he says, I'm going to die, and the disciples say, you're not going to die. And then Jesus says, no, I'm going to die. And then Jesus said, I'm going to die, and the disciples say, you're not going to die. And then Jesus says, no, I'm going to die. And the disciples say, no, you're not going to die, and then he dies. Like, well, that, well, that, that's confounding. Why would the God who brings life enter into death? Because his death was not for himself, but for you and me. And Jesus enters into death only to show that he has power over death. And nothing Jesus did in his life showed his authority as that which he did in his death and resurrection. And John says, you won't believe it. It's such good news, I have to tell it to you, that the God who created the world, are you ready for this, has entered into the world to perform an act of redemption and new creation. He says, all that humanity messed up, 
it will be God himself that will set in motion a plan to fix it, to redeem it, to make it new. If you have a Bible today, John 20, verses 1 through 22, I think many Christians know this is a very familiar text, but I want to point out some things that I am sure John, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, wants us to see, and he might be disappointed that we have yet to see them, so today we're going to see them. Notice John 20, verse 1. We read 18 verses. The first big idea today is Jesus' resurrection reveals that a new day has emerged in the midst of a world in need. Verse 1 says, On the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark. She saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she ran to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. At that, Peter and the other disciple went out heading for the tomb. The two were running together, but the disciple outran Peter and got to the tomb first. Stooping down, he saw the linen cloths lying there, yet he did not go in. Then following him, Simon Peter came also. He entered the tomb and saw the linen cloths lying there. The wrapping that had been on his head was not lying with the linen cloth, but was folded up in a separate place by itself. The other disciple who had reached the tomb first, then entered the tomb, saw and believed, for they still did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples went home again. But Mary stood outside facing the tomb, crying, As she was crying, she stooped to look into the tomb. She saw the two angels in white sitting there, one at the head and one at the feet, where Jesus' body had been lying. They said to her, Woman, why are you crying? Because they've taken away my Lord, she told them, and I don't know where they have put him. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, though she did not know it was Jesus. Woman, Jesus said to her, Why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? Supposing he was the gardener, she replied, Sir, if you have removed him, tell me where you put him, and I will take him away. Jesus said, Mary. Turning around, she said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. Don't cling to me, Jesus told her, for I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brothers and tell them that I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God, Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and she told them what he had said to her. As I've already made it abundantly clear, it is the Gospel of John in John 1 that has us look at creation and then see that God's original creation has been messed up and Jesus re-entering creation in the incarnation, taking on flesh, sets in process a plan of redemption to ultimately renew creation. Now, if you can just follow along with me, which I clearly believe that John intended to leave these clues for us, if I were to say, what did God do on day one? And God said, let there be light. That's exactly what God did. And so notice John begins John 20 on the first day of the week. It's almost as if John John is saying the old creation has been messed up so I'm going to have to start again because creation God rested on Saturday because he started on Sunday went all the way to Saturday but in John 20 on the first day of the week here comes a new act of God working in the world. And notice, Mary comes. Well, this is such a beautiful image here. Mary comes to the tomb while it was still dark. John does this all the time. In John 3, when Nicodemus comes at night, he stays in the dark. And when the Samaritan woman comes in John 4 at noon, She stays in the light. John is always writing one thing on top of another. Mary comes in the darkness, but on the first day of the week, God is about to reintroduce light and life back into his world in a way he has never done it before. Now then the gospel gospel writer tells us that two people 
get running to the tomb. You have the disciple Jesus loved, who's likely the author of the gospel, John and Simon Peter. And John informs us that Peter's legs evidently weren't where they used to be because he got there first, Simon Peter got there second. They looked in the tomb, and yet they believed, but they didn't fully understand But it is as if John says, I'm not going to focus on Peter and John. I'm going to focus on Mary. John uniquely focuses on Mary in this particular episode. Now, why is Mary coming to the tomb? Well, word about first century burial practices to understand why Mary is coming to the tomb. Jesus died at 3 o'clock on a Friday, Good Friday. And then Jesus had to be off the cross and, 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 and buried probably about 5 or 6 o'clock because maybe you didn't notice this in Genesis either, but Jewish people count time not morning to evening, but evening to morning. It says in the evening and the morning were the first day. So the Sabbath begins at the evening and, and, and then early Sunday morning the Sabbath ends if you track all of this. Nevertheless, uh, so Jesus has to be off the cross because Jewish people can't bury on a Saturday because they can't work on a Saturday. And so there's a quite hasty burial of Jesus. Now, if you die, they whisk you away never to be seen again until they see you all beautiful if you want to be beautiful in a casket. That's not the way it worked in the first century. The first century you died and they wrapped you up in linens, uh, in linen cloth, not because they're mummifying you, but because within the cloth, they've got to stick spices because you stink. That's just the way things go. And this was done very hastily to Jesus. It had to be. And so Jesus really hasn't gotten a proper burial. Also in the first century, they didn't put you in a hole in the ground. They put you in a tomb. And a tomb is kind of like a cave. It's not underground, not necessarily. It could be kind of in the ground, you know. Nevertheless, they they put you then... They would bring you in and lay you on a slab in the tomb, and then they would roll the stone back in place. And then they would kind of wait. Because if you lay on the slab long enough, you decay to the degree that there's nothing left of you but your bones. So then they gather your bones up, put them in a box, and put you on the shelf and write Rusty's bones right there, you know? And then the next person's up, you know, for the... And so you could have a whole tomb full of a whole family, and that you have a family tomb. And Jesus, we're told, that he had a new tomb. He's the first person ever been in the tomb. There's not a bunch of bone boxes from a bunch of people that are there. So why does Mary wait till early Sunday morning? Well, because the Sabbath starts Saturday evening, and then I guess Saturday, I mean, a Friday evening, and it ends Saturday evening, but once it's Saturday evening, it's dark, and it's not good for a woman, and maybe not even for a man to be bumping around in the dark because you might get mugged. So what does Mary do? She waits to the earth, the, the, as soon as she can come, and her whole reason wasn't to come to the tomb to expect a resurrection. I mean, please. Her, her reason for coming to the tomb was to just give Jesus a decent burial. And she does this. She's so grieved. She hadn't really thought through her order of operations that the other gospels say she doesn't even know how she's going to get the stone out of the place because she won't be able to because it's too, too much for one person to move. And John wants to zoom in right now because Mary gets to the tomb to finish the burial practices and then a tragedy upon tragedies. Mary goes... It isn't enough that Jesus was horrifically killed. It isn't enough that he died so violently. But, and, and he didn't get a decent burial. And now I come to the tomb and the tomb's been desecrated. And you can imagine at this particular moment the unbelievable sorrow that, Matthew, uh, that Mary has. Now John is quick to tell us, listen carefully, That Jesus is buried, listen to these words, thank Genesis 1, in a garden that has a tomb. Now when God made gardens, the Garden of Eden, there were no tombs in them. And so now there is, Jesus is buried in a garden 
tomb. What in the world is a tomb doing in a garden? Well, because humanity's messed everything up, and it is humanity that introduced death into God's good garden. And notice here, John, I think, is just showing off a little bit, because when Jesus calls out to Mary, she doesn't know it's Jesus, and she supposes Jesus to be the gardener. And in some ways, John's like, well, he kind of is the gardener. You know, he made the first garden, and he's about to remake the garden again. And, and I always think it's funny, you know, Tom here is our, our, our caretaker of the cemetery, and Johnny Canada did it for years, and Tom, you're a poor substitute for Jesus, you know. I mean, Mary thought, uh, I mean, sorry, I mean, you're a good guy. I mean, we're all poor substitutes, but it's like Mary's first, again, Mary's not thinking resurrection. She's like, Tom, you know, are you weed eating this early in the morning? You know, I mean, are you removing stuff off the stones this early in the morning? You know, I mean, how ridiculous. That's what's happening here. And so God, supposing him to be the gardener, and now notice, again, John's making all of this the case. And what happens? Mary and Jesus embrace. Can you see it? A man and a woman embracing in a garden. It's almost like I'm going to put all this back together again. I'm going to fix what you messed up. And yet, here's the deal. I want to make this point on this Easter Sunday is that the resurrection of Jesus, listen carefully, because Mary embraces and she's like, I'm not going to let you go. And Jesus said, look, um, the resurrection is not God's final action. This is just his first action of restoration. I mean, this isn't all, it's not like Jesus is alive and he's done. Oh, no. Jesus is alive and you trust in him. You'll have an experience of resurrection and God will make all things new and he'll come again and, and, and. The resurrection is just the first action. It's not the final action in God's drama. And so Mary's grabbing onto him. And, and in essence, Jesus pushes Mary back and says, yeah, you ought to be happy. Yes, this is an important moment. But in essence, Jesus looks at Mary and says, you hadn't seen anything yet. If you think this is glorious, just wait and see the process of redemption I'm about to put into place. What is the first thing that Jesus tells Mary to do? Go tell the disciples that God has done something new in the world and that the world needs to know that the world of light that's shrouded in darkness, light has emerged once again. Now, I want to make a few points here just to kind of run this application down as far as it needs to go. Uh, you know, we, I have access, like everybody else does, to social media, and it's made the world very small. And I have some friends in Israel, and uh, Israel's having a tough time right now, and, uh, but they're still doing all their Good Friday, Easter Sunday services. And so I've been watching them, you know, on watching their services, and I comment, and they'll comment on my, my stuff, and the world's a very small place indeed. I mean, if you just get in your car and you know, drive to New York City, which most of you don't want to do, but New York City is not a bad place to be. I'm sorry if you don't like it. I like it. Uh, you know, and uh, you take a flight from JFK to Tel Aviv, 12 hours, and voila, you're in Israel. Now, you say, why do you say that? I say this because what John is describing is an action that took place in this world. If, if the Bible would have said Jesus was buried in Appomattox and raised in Pamplin, you know, that has a different ring to it, you understand? But it is no different to say Jesus was buried in Jerusalem and raised in Jerusalem because both Appomattox and Pamplin in Jerusalem happen to be in this world. It's not in some other realm. It's not in some other space. God entered into the world that he created and he lived among us, he died, and he rose again in this world. This is in some ways a very earthly hope. That is historic Christianity. If anybody tells you that's not what Christians have believed, that's exactly what Christians have believed. And, and the earliest Christians went to their death believing exactly that if they were killed, that God would raise their physical bodies from the grave. And so this is not just a sentimental thing. The God who created the world has done something new in the world. That's what the gospel writers want to tell us loud and clear. Secondarily, I will say this. 
And one of the burdens of being a pastor, I don't think I actually realized how much of a burden this was. I mean, it's a blessing too, but one of the burdens of being a pastor is you just see so much bad you know, it's like, you know, people call doctors and pastors, not when things are good usually, but things are kind of falling off the rails. And I've, I've, so many people have asked me questions like, where is God in my suffering? Or where is God in this evil? Or where is God uh, in this moment? And I'll just be honest with you. Sometimes I've heard stories of things that have happened to people and I have no direct answer on why God allowed that. I just have, I don't have an answer. A few things I do know that God's not unconcerned about your suffering because he died on the cross. And if God is on the cross, what is he doing there? He's taking suffering quite seriously. And I think there are some good arguments for how God can be good, how, why God is good in their suffering. I mean, by the way, there actually is no actual evil if there isn't an actual good, and there's no actual good if there's not God. I mean, even the philosophers figured that out who weren't Christians. So you can work through all of that, but all of that kind of, even with somebody who's grieving, even good arguments kind of end like a thud. They're just like, okay, all right, you won that argument, but I'm still upset about it. You made that point, but I'm still grieved. Let me tell you something, that God's answer to suffering and evil is not an argument. It's an action. You know what people want? They want, they want full restoration. They want what that, that which was taken from them to be given back to them. And here's the beauty of Easter Sunday. The resurrection of Jesus gives us insight into a God who the worst was done to him and he rose from the dead. And, and that first act gives us a glimpse into God's final act in which all that is taken from you, are you ready for this? When the Lord returns and raises your body and makes all things new, all that is taken from you in this life will be given back to you in a greater way than you can ever imagine. You cannot even begin, and honestly, part of the beauty of God's new creation, part of the beauty of God's new world is the places of deep, deepest brokenness. Those will be exactly the places where God does the greatest restoration uh, project. God is, not in, in, God is not a God who just wants to throw away things once they're broken. God is a God who takes broken things and makes them new. And the resurrection of Jesus gives you a clear insight into this. You say, is, is God's restoration when he returns and makes all things new, is it really going to be that good? Why don't you just listen to what the Apostle Paul says in Romans 8, 18. Listen to these words. Paul says, for I consider the suffering of this present time. And I mean, add it up. A lot of suffering. Paul says, for I consider that the suffering of this present time, are you ready for this? Are not worth comparing to the glory that's going to be revealed. I have preached that text at so many funerals after somebody has gone through a grueling, grinding, slow walk to death. I have been there as the IV drips. I have been there as the pain meds don't work. I have been there as people cry and pray and get no relief. And Paul says the suffering of this present time will be so eclipsed by what God is go going to do in the future that that will seem as nothing. Well, I'm going to say that's going to be something. And this is the hope that Christianity gives to us, that God has come into time and space and he has done an act of new creation and says, you ready for it? I'm just getting started. Now you say, you know, it's not enough that Jesus has been raised. Uh, we're still kind of a mess. And now Jesus, after the resurrection, says, I'm going to have to go over here and have a little talk with my other disciples, I mean, Mary could show up, and Peter and John could show up. Where's the rest of you? And now we are, I'll show you the second and final point 
to, to show you that the resurrection is not the final act, but in some ways the first act, and God's going to start opening up all kinds of things to show us that He is a God of redemption. Notice uh, Jesus' resurrection reveals to us the second big idea that a new spirit filled task has been given to those who believe in Jesus. Notice verse 19. In the evening of the first day of the week. By the way, I just want to say this. Did you know Jesus' resurrection on the first day of the week is so important that every week we show up on Sunday to let everybody know that this new event happened? That's why Christians worship on Sunday. Said the disciples were gathered together with doors locked because of their fear of the Jews. Then Jesus came, stood among them, and said to them, Peace to you. Having said this, he showed them his hands and his side, so the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Then Jesus said to them again, Peace to you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. After saying this, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. Now, part of this. If you get nothing else, when you die and go see John, he's going to ask, could you read my book, the Gospel of John, and we want you to have read the book and at least not missed what he laid there. So obviously, because if you can see it, Jesus is alive. Where are the disciples? Huddled up in despair. By the way, here's a very important point. Hope can be in the world, real and profound hope, and people can still not know anything about it. I propose that there are tons of people who don't know anything about it. I propose there are a lot of people who do know about it and have rejected it. But there is a world of hope. That's the paradox we live in, that real hope, Jesus is alive, and yet the disciples, where are they? Despairing. That's not the way it should be. So guess what? When you have despairing people in a world of hope, guess what you need to do? You need to go tell the people that are despairing about the hope. And guess what? Jesus comes and he comes to this despairing, afraid group and he does not speak a word of condemnation about all their, misgive, all their missteps. You know what he does? He comes among them and just speaks peace. The great Jewish word, shalom. He says peace, goodness, well-being. It's all I'm here to give you. And he says, you know, I knew you guys couldn't work out of this, so I did it for you. You hear my hands? Here's my side. Believe me. And then they do. They do believe in Jesus. And then he says, now that you have moved from despair to hope, guess what? There's still a lot more despairing people in a world, world, of, a world of hope. So guess what Jesus says? I wish you don't, please do not miss this. Easter, so many times people think, oh, Easter Sunday, Jesus is alive, and one day I'll rise, and there's nothing to do in the meantime. That's not what Jesus says. Jesus says, I have done a new work in the world, but not everyone is aware of it. So Jesus says, as the Father sent me, he looks at the disciples and says, so I send you. Go tell the world that the God who created the world has entered into the world and has opened up a whole new realm. That's why if you think church is just about coming and attending. No, no, it's, it's not a, a church should be measured not by how many come, but by how many go. And a church should be measured by how far the gospel shines, not just about how many people gather. Gathering is important, but sending means you actually got the message and you realize that in a world of hope, there are still despairing people and you need to go tell them about the light of Jesus because the resurrection is God's first act, but not his final act. So there is still time to deliver the message of hope to a despairing world. Now, I want to point out one other thing, and I conclude. You've got a problem. You're still a sinner. So you know what you need? You need somebody to make you new. Well, good thing Jesus provided that. Because he looks, at the, he, he looks at his disciples. You ready for this? And we believe in the Trinity, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. They're all God. Three persons, one essence. And he breathes on them the Holy Spirit. Are you ready? To, maybe you can... Hopefully you can hear this. When you become a Christian, God moves you. Are you ready for this? The Ephesians 2 says this. 
and you were dead in your trespasses and sins. So you just listen carefully. You're dead in your trespasses and sins, but God has made you alive. Now, a person who was dead and has been made alive, that sounds like, to me, a, a resurrection. That's exactly what that sounds like. Because the Spirit of God has some, done something new in you, and He has raised you spiritually. And here's the, here's the deal. You see, Christ is raised. Now, those who come to Christ and the Spirit in, in fills, their, fills their heart and does the work of regeneration, John 3, to be born again. Now, you're, a, you're spiritually raised. You ready for this? And our spiritual raising guarantees, are you ready for it? Our physical raising. There it is. Because God has instituted a new creation plan in the world. And you ready for what John's saying? He says, and he breathes upon his disciples the breath of life. That's what he did to Adam. And it's as if John is saying, all that you took from the world, humanity, God came to the world and he gave it all back to you. Now that's hope. And the resurrection is not God's first action. I mean, think about this. Oh, you, you're not ready for this. I don't think so. You guys are too thinking about those donuts in the hallway and lunch. But I'm going to tell you about something that should really motivate you. Think about this. In a world that could be hopeless, Christ is risen. Really risen. In a soul that could be dead, your soul, the Spirit of God has made you new. In a world that could have no communion, Christ has built a church and said that we can have communion with Him and other people. And all of this, are you ready for it? Is just a foretaste of God's final action. Just think about it. I've been pastor long enough to know I'm glad for the crowd that's here, but there's a whole other crowd that's already in, in glory. And I just can think of the day where God on his final act says, the Father doesn't say to the Son, arise. The Son says to all the saints, arise. And you think this is a crowd. Wait till the crowd that shows up. I'm going to tell you. And they're going to, they're going to actually be more excited than you are right now because they're going to have resurrected bodies and we're going to be on a redeemed creation. And there we will spend not a moment. Jesus will say, cling on me now as long as you want to. Because welcome to new creation. No more sickness, no more death, no more crying, no more pain. This is God's world. The one he created and remade, he will remake again. And every Sunday we gather. We gather in faith, pointing to Christ's resurrection in the past and looking to our resurrection in the future. You know, you say, Rusty, pastorally, what does this matter? Hope you listen to me right now. We live in a world that is, is so loaded up in anxiety and depression and suicidality and my heart does nothing but bleed for that. But I want to tell you something. I don't think the ultimate solution to a culture of anxiety, a culture of depression, a culture of suicidality will be resolved by just doing a few techniques. I am a counselor. There's something deep within a person that has to decide, is the world a good place with hope? Or is the world a dark place with just suffering and meaninglessness? If you have believed that this creation, that, that, that we have come from nowhere, we are going to nothing, and the meaning that we have we make it up based upon how we deeply look inside of ourselves to find whatever we find inside of ourselves and exactly how we find it, I don't know. But once we find it, it can't be, can't be critiqued. And then out of that, we live a fulfilling life. Foolishness. That is, not, that, that is a lie, and that will keep a person down. The Bible says that the very God who exists created the world and he did it in a good way. 
that the world is in fact ugly and suffering is in fact real. But God has not left us on our own but entered into it, died on a cross in our place and risen again, and that there is plenty of signposts in the present that the God who created has recreated, and there are signposts in the present that point to a future that the God who started a process of restoration will finish the process. That will fill a person with hope even in the midst of sorrow, even in the midst of pain, even in the midst of death, because they know that sin and death haven't gotten the final say-so. And I do deeply believe that this has to be believed at such a deep and gut level that your heavenly Father knows what you need and He cares for you. That's what the Bible says. And the gospel shout that message. And I pray today you believe that message, not because it'll make you feel better, but because it's true. Some of you are here today. You're not a Christian. You know, the wonderful thing about God is that He's done all of this for us and yet doesn't force His way in. He says, won't you come? Won't you believe? The Gospel of John in John 20 says, these things I've written to you so that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah and that by believing you may have life in his name. You say, what does it take to become a Christian? To say, God, I admit I'm a sinner and God, by faith, I trust in Jesus. If you're here today and you're not a Christian, why don't you walk this aisle? This is not perfunctory. This is an invitation an invitation to trust in Jesus. And quite frankly, this is an opportunity. We'll take a Bible and show you how you can become a Christian. And if you need prayer for any reason, if you're just beaten down and you say, I need to hear that there is a God of hope who has initiated hope in the world, that's what the Bible says. That's what God offers. We'll pray for you. The church is an instrument of God's grace that he's given to the world. So use it for the purposes that God has given. The altar is open, whatever the need, becoming a Christian, saying, God, may you fill my heart with hope, or whatever else. The altar is open. Make the response as God leads you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we ask you, God, on this Easter Sunday morning, God, we thank you that we can look to an empty tomb and reveal that the glory of the empty tomb It's not the end of the story, but the death, the burial, the resurrection, the sending of the Holy Spirit is just the latest installment of your redemption plan. And God, we're so thankful for what has happened. But God, we so look forward to the fact of what will happen. And God, we long for that final day where you make it all new that our resurrection day will in fact be the final day. God, we will live with you in a beautiful garden for all eternity. God, we give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. The resurrection of our Lord has given us hope, and one day our bodies will be resurrected. We will see Jesus face to face sing together. Lord, I confess that I've been a criminal, I've stolen your breath, and sang my own song. Lord, I confess that I'm far from innocent. Shackles I wear, I bought on my own. Scarlet sins had a crimson cost. You nailed my debt to that old rugged cross. An empty slate at the end. Walked 
Have a wonderful day.